So hi, folks. Uh, so uh, my name is Phil, Phil Porras. I uh, am at the Stanford Research Institute. I'm also a founder of a, of, a, of a cloud security company called Acunox. And you know, Acunox is a cloud security company. I'm talking about 5G because we'll explain the synergy between 5G and its movement towards software-defined abstraction and how that is based around the development of virtualized workloads that run the control plane and actually run pretty much all the different components uh, that are software-based inside 5G stacks. Uh, and how do we go th and think about security with respect to 5G? And um, uh, I'm going to broaden this talk to talk a little bit more just about mobile wireless, where we're going with mobile wireless, and all the different things that we are doing as a group. Uh, this is under something, a project that we've been working on called uh, SE RAN, Security Enhanced Radio Access Networks. And all of our stuff we just dump on a site called 5gsec.com. So the components I'm talking about, we have open source packages. Those are available on, on Git repos that you can download and play with. Um, and so the group that's been working on this has been Ohio State University, SRI International, and I'm from Menlo Park. It's based in Menlo Park near Stanford University. And Acunox, our spin-off company that is highly successful in cloud security. Uh, I'm going to cover a couple of topics. One is I'm just going to talk about merging mobile and security and why security is interesting uh, in mobile networking. And in particular, in the ORAN 5G context, I'll also talk about security sort of in two contexts. One is just at the edge when you're trying to understand the security between devices that are communicating to radio access networks, what's happening inside the base station, and the control plane and the core, what's happening with all of the software that's managing, controlling, monitoring, uh, adjusting policies for all of the radio access networks that they're governing. So I'll call that the secure, secure control plane, and I'll uh, refer to anything to protect devices and, and base stations as sort of uh, edge security. And the applications that do that monitoring, that analysis, and discover those threats and try to do recovery would be um, X apps and R apps, apps that run basically based on event sequences that tip you off that there's a problem, and then applications that are more strategic and try to understand what's happening uh, and diagnose problems, classify certain behaviors in the network that require more time, like um, non-real-time R apps. I'll talk about Nephio and intent-based networking as well and how that role is. Uh, I'm basically just scratching the surface on the work. We do talk a lot about and try to explain our perspective of 5G so what do we mean by security enhancements? We published some white papers. There's a white paper out uh, that is published on the Nephio um, Linux Foundation site on 5G enhanced open radio access networks and what's our perspective of security from, from uh, on this particular topic. I wrote that paper. And then my colleague uh, Rahul Jadav wrote the um, uh, a pretty detailed explanation of what do we mean by intent-driven security, which is kind of a really interesting direction that we're going as we try to add security to uh, um, to, to Nephew and to, to modern 5G. So uh, emerging mobile wireless use cases are really dredging up a lot of um, mission critical scenarios where security becomes quite important. So when we think of, uh, hey, we're gonna do ORAN security, uh, we also think about things in terms of the context of the applications, the use cases where you might wanna do these things. For example, if you're developing private 5G, for traditional enterprise and you're ripping out ethernet cables and you're bringing in 5G into large enterprise or campus network environments, think about security from that perspective versus at Tesla, try to do you building a, a 5G networks to support robotics environments uh, or uh, dealing with uh, next generation 911 and trying to overlay security slices on top of existing telco infrastructure. What are the different security problems you have to deal with? There's a lot of different use cases for uh, ORAN and each has its own separable notion potentially of security, of what compliance means, what you are willing to spend on for security, et cetera. So when we do talk about security uh, and ORAM, we may talk about it in, the, in various contexts like private 5G versus telcos. So 5G is really opening, democratizing uh, the ability for us to use kind of the notions of uh, 5G mobile networking for a variety of different use cases. When we migrate over to wireless networking, it becomes a compelling use case or compelling technology to bring into a lot of different use cases. And so, yes, we have the idea of LTE, very centric around mobile, 5G, which is really opening up uh, mobile networking to lots of different interesting use cases with lots of different security implications. But what do we really mean by mission-based or mission-critical 5G networking that might be operating, on, say, on an aircraft carrier or you know, inside DOD or in some sort of uh, environment where it, health, safety, uh, become really important. So we do care about security. We tend to care about it from a high end. 
We also talk to stakeholders and integrators about uh, security as well as people who are early adopters. So there aren't that many of, of 5G networking. And there are some common themes that come out. One is, hey, if I'm going to be out there developing 5G network infrastructures and try to create solutions for you to deploy 5G, reputation is very difficult to, to recover from. You want to have reputational trust that when you create a 5G solution, you've got some notion of it's secure for you to actually operate. Uh, if you're an operator, well, you're probably not very experienced with 5G. You have uh, skill sets maybe in traditional IP networking. How does it apply to 5G? Well, it would be great if I had tool sets, solutions that help me think through how do I manage and observe and see what's happening inside my 5G network from a security perspective as well as manage runtime security posture. So there's a need for security from the perspective of the operators. And then both have a simple realization that if I deploy a 5G network or hand you a 5G network to deploy, and it's easily pushed over, it's easily disrupted, it's easily attacked, uh, devices are not secure in it, uh, that's going to be fatal to our rollout. You're going to pull back from wanting to deploy it, and uh, I'm going to have a lot of trouble trying to deploy the next one. So we really do want to make uh, resilient uh, networks as we roll them out into different environments. So those are three motivational reasons why uh, people care about security, why we get feedback, that this, sort of, this topic is actually essential to trying to develop out and deploy 5G. If you think about 5G in the context, uh, not necessarily of telco, but of private 5G or of other 5G use cases, there's a similarity to uh, traditional IP networks where we have firewalls and routers and workstations. Uh, we have management stations, and we know how to do IP-based wire, wired network security. Um, but in the context of, say, uh, 5G networks, do we have the same sort of notions? Well, we're going to have ephemeral devices that are going to connect to not routers and switches, but to base stations. They are going to be observed, interfered with. They're going to not operate correctly or have problems interacting with base stations. We want to, of course, be able to observe those. The base station operations themselves, we need to be able to understand from a security perspective what's happening. And of course, we're going to be managing so much software to control, uh, coordinate, to optimize the, the 5G uh, radio access network. We want all of that software not to become its own attack surface as well. So we have to deal with some issues. One issue we have to deal with is observability. How do we actually see from a security perspective what's happening is early on is the device talking to the base station. From a security perspective, what's happening inside of the base station, we need to be able to see that information. And by default, you don't get a lot of that detail. You don't get that security audit telemetry that lets you drive a lot of the analysis. Uh, so we started looking at that problem. We developed our own solution, our own security telemetry that we could augment into existing CU, DU radio access networks that let us see the security relevant information. If you have that information, you could start building applications on top that do security analysis, like runtime threat monitoring or fault detection, et cetera. And so we have been developing those as well. You can develop them from an event-oriented perspective, like build X apps that basically are looking for sequences or, or statistics inside of the radio access network that tell you that there may be a problem and decide that there's something worth alerting about. Or you might do that more deeply looking at behavior patterns of devices of what's happening inside the base station and come up with deeper conclusions, like drive through, uh, say, machine learning based applications. Uh, the other aspect of that, of course, is you want to be able to lock down any attack surface that you have within your 5G network. And moving so much of the control, the management of 5G networks into a modular architecture is wonderful. Uh, breaking the, the different uh, components into serviceable network functions that can be deployed in the cloud and managed that way is also a very useful thing. It al allows for a lot of extensibility, but it op also opens up attack surfaces. There are lots of ways to attack uh, workloads in the cloud, and having some of those basic hygiene security functions to protect, to analyze, to lock down in the least permissive ways, those network services is quite important as well. So we're developing, in, developing technologies to do that as well. And if you could bring all of that together and you could see security events from the devices to the base station, to the RAN operations across multiple base stations, to the control plane to look for interactions that will tell you that your network functions, your services are secure or not secure or are violating policies. If you can get that breadth of a, of a view, you can start putting that all together under a single pane of glass and building out uh, a protection platform that lets you see what's happening and manage your 5G network in a similar way that you would manage, say, your, um, uh, your traditional network. Um, sorry, I'm just going to turn this off. 
Let me talk a little bit about edge security and XMs. So think about um, the way 5G networks are structured, of course, is having uh, the radio unit that uh, collects signals from the devices. Those devices uh, and their signals are establishing links with the base station. So we have software to handle the link establishment. We have software to, to do session establishment, authentication, and then manage the, uh, from the data plane, manage all of the communications and data flows between those devices and the core. And then, of course, on top, you have the uh, uh, control plane that are all these different applications that let you manage those radio access networks. What's really interesting from a 5G perspective is when we move, remove wires and we start exposing uh, our devices and the, uh, the internet and the, the, the network that we're talking to, we're basically working toward emission-based networking. Everything is generating emissions. And that provides an, a, an ability for adversaries to see everything that's happening. They may not be able to decode and understand exactly what's happening, but they can see the traffic. They may be able to inject traffic, and they may be able to interfere with the traffic. And there's a variety of different attack strategies that have been emerging, particularly in the last three years, uh, in terms of attack strategies that can be used by modern software-defined radios to engage devices, engage space stations, disrupt them, intercede, or uh, man in the middle, attack them. And what we need to develop are solutions that allow us to modularly insert services that let us see those activities and detect exactly what's happening and generate alerts around those. Uh, if you look just to say from 2019, the academic community has actually been quite busy building out lots of different adversarial scenarios, lots of different cellular layer three based attack strategies for engaging devices or base stations. Uh, we've been documenting them, understanding how they work and developing out telemetry that lets us see when those events, when those sorts of uh, attack scenarios are occurring. That's what mobile flow is essentially about. So inside of a, uh, uh, inside the ORAN architecture, the way that we build X apps to drive analysis of what's happening at the base stations is we'll use E2 service models. There really is not an E2 service model sufficiently detailed enough for us to, to look for security attacks. Essentially, the kinds of data and traffic we'd be extracting to try to do security analysis is a little different than trying to do performance monitoring and, and uh, resource management. So we saw inefficiencies. And around 2022, we wrote a paper uh, at Conext about how do we go uh, extending the E2SM model to add security services that let us see these sorts of attacks. We built out something called the SecSM, a security monitoring tool that allows us to generate a new kind of telemetry that is an E2 compliant telemetry that lets us now write X apps or R apps. We could use expert systems, deep learning engines to now do analysis to detect layer three cellular attacks. Um, we built out something called uh, MobileFlow for uh, generating uh, telemetry that lets us see the interactions, the layer three protocol interactions between devices and base stations, as well as collect the security relevant uh, statistics about what's happening inside of the base stations so we could see anomalies inside the base station from a security administrative perspective. We published a paper around that, which I just mentioned, um, and we, we defined that as a, a, a telemetry stream called MobileFlow. And then on top of MobileFlow, we can then, if we are able to generate these E2 streams, we can build X apps and R apps that can actually process that data and generate uh, analyses. One uh, example tool set that we built was called 5G Spectre, which is an expert system that processes MobileFlow and tries to detect a wide range of these cellular attacks. And it simply would be deployed inside of a near real-time RIC um, that's ORAN compliant. You'd be able to use that uh, by pro and process uh, MobileFlow telemetry. Um, we actually built and packaged uh, and now distribute uh, 5G Spectre with a little uh, attack environment that generates the security attacks, uh, allows you to drive um, an, uh, a test example to run 5G Spectre. Uh, and we just recently published that and made that available. You can download it. You can, if you want to play with 5G Spectre and play with cellular attacks, you can download and run it and, and actually play with these, these attacks and run our detection tool to generate the same alerts. And we want an award for generating that, um, that package. Uh, it's available on Git. A lot, there's a lot of uh, activity in people uh, uh, involved in trying to do analysis of 5G networks and add more autonomy to the 5G network to handle things like resource management, energy management. There's a wide range of reasons why you could, and, and techniques for applying AI to solve different problems in 5G. Here's kind of a bullet list. I'm sorry it's so small, but there's a bullet list of, of different use cases for 5G to solve a lot of different optimization, resource economic sorts of problems inside of 5G environments. The red ones correspond to kind of our interest level in terms of how would I use 
deep learning strategies, machine learning to detect security-related uh, events. That does involve you know, asking questions like fundamentally, is our telemetry, the feature sets that we extract uh, from the radio access network enough that let, let us drive meaningful uh, machine clustering, machine, uh, uh, machine learning, deep learning uh, techniques. Uh, and these are the sorts of um, uh, um, objectives that we have when we're trying to build AI on top of uh, 5G. And there we might be packaging them as X apps or as R apps, non-real-time uh, um, applications that try to uh, swallow or analyze uh, ET streams looking for models that would tell us that there's something wrong, there's a fault, a failure, there is an attack. We had a lot of difficulty in trying to build uh, deep learning applications on top of the open source projects that were out there. A recent one that's come out for which we are actually now building um, examples of our apps that run deep learning algorithms on top is the um, ORAN SC because they've been providing features that allow us to more easily, they, they're building basically an, MI, an AI ML framework that let us build uh, machine learning applications. And so we've been recently building toward uh, putting AI on top of uh, this particular um, project, this particular 5G open source project. Some of the highlights here is that they've got a Kafka supported data lake uh, that we can use to process data in both the non-real-time RIC and the near real-time RIC. Uh, the LeoFS uh, model storage uh, services are supported there, Cassandra feature stores. So now we can start uh, extracting and collecting data lakes of features, uh, putting models inside um, uh, the store, and then building our applications on top. The application we're working on right now is something called 5G Deep Watch, which is we're using LSTMs and playing with transformers. We're basically looking at device protocols and seeing if we can learn the protocols and recognize deviations from those protocols. Certainly do machine labeling and be able to recognize patterns of protocol misuse that would tell us that there's a fault or a failure. Enough so that it's not just an event sequence that we would generate an alert about, but there's a pattern of activity that would tell us we should respond to this. I mean, ultimately where we all wanna go is an ability to have smart, intelligent, systems that could recognize failures and faults, recognize malicious phenomena, be able to diagnose exactly what's causing that phenomena, and take steps to manipulate the network in a way that will let us recover from that. And that's kind of where we're, we're all trying to get to. Uh, DeepWatch is sort of an early example of an E2-based, mobile flow-based uh, telemetry analysis system that's using, uh, in this case, LSTMs to do prediction on the sequences of uh, of uh, UE pr uh, protocol patterns to tell us if there's an anomaly, to tell us if there's a pattern that seems to match uh, one of the models that's been trained on. We've been actually using uh, something uh, called Coliseum, which is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Coliseum, but it's one of those test networks that's been set up that allow you to do large scale collection of virtual 5G network data traffic. So you can start building models on normal UE patterns not, and you can also inject an overlay on that attack patterns where we generate the attack patterns overlay them on very large 5G network data, uh, data captures that we've done inside of Coliseum, merge those together and we can start training machine models. And so this is one of the techniques um, we've been using. Hopefully we'll be coming out with a paper shortly on uh, 5G Deep Watch. Let me talk a little bit, moving away from, uh, let me call all that work edge security. The ability to basically analyze 5G protocol interactions between you, uh, user devices, the base station, what's happening inside of the base station, and look for threatening patterns, faulty patterns, that tell us that there's a problem, try to diagnose what that problem is. We'll call that edge security. The other aspect of this is that your entire control plane and core are network functions that are tied together to interact with one another to implement the 5G control plane. That opens up opportunities for adversaries to attack you from a software perspective. So here what we re would really like to do is focus on how do we implement zero trust architectures security compliance policies with enforcement on those network functions that are operating in the, in the control plane. How do we go about doing that? Uh, what do we mean by the best practices from security with respect to configurations, with respect to how you would monitor or remove potential uh, 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 adversarial techniques? How do you mitigate uh, uh, particular adversarial techniques? Well, are people defining those? Yeah, there, are, there definitely are. Um, groups that are out there trying to develop out what do we mean by uh, compliance with respect to security policies that would provide meaningful security for 5G networks. Uh, MITRE FIGHT is an example of that. INSA, the 3GPP has a whole variety of, of um, example policies um, or threat scenarios that you should be able to address 
to secure your 5G network, or you should consider. So there is an emerging set of um, security standards, uh, advis advisements that tell us how do we think about uh, locking down uh, 5G networks from a security perspective. The question is if we have and understand those, those attack techniques, those proper security policies, can we implement them? That's one question. Um, and that gets into what it is we're trying to do. Um, I should note that there is a security um, uh, special interest group uh, for the Nefio project. Are you guys familiar with Nefio? Well, obviously you are. Nefio is a Google-born uh, um, telco automation project that is being run by the Linux Foundation. It focuses on edge, cloud, and 5G. Uh, and in particular, it's being driven by a lot of the requirements coming out of the automated telco 5G world. So there's lots of some of the premier stakeholders in 5G in the US are participating in FEO to develop a way to instantiate 5G networks in a different way using intent-based networking where we specify the requirements and the intents of what we want our network to do and we enable software to go off and construct a topology, build the admission uh, of that, create the network for us and then deploy and manage it in runtime as much as possible, try to automate and reduce the level of effort it takes to go from a description of what your, a natural language description of what your network is going to do to the implementation of that network and deployment of that network. The security working group is looking at security from all the different angles. I don't mean to be just focusing on runtime. They are looking at the issues of how do we do uh, proper security hygiene uh, from the development perspective. As we develop out the software, are we doing good security hygiene to make sure that that software is going through its paces to make sure that it's secure? When we release, when we release that software, are we managing the releases and the versioning correctly. When we deploy it, are we doing validation? Are we deploying in a secure manner and validating some, some degree of, yes, this is meeting a security policy or it doesn't? Uh, and then runtime, once you start executing a, uh, uh, a 5G network and it is starting to orchestrate and manage the network, is it continuing to run in the original intended way? Uh, from a security perspective, that gets into this notion, what do we mean by in the intended way from a security perspective, which is the one I'm going to talk about next. But right now, the uh, release two has come out, and there are security functions that have been added, uh, and the security working group is working on all of those issues, not just the ones I'm about to talk about, but everything from you know, uh, coding hygiene down to deployment and release and, and runtime analysis. Let me just look at one perspective, which is how do we deal with security? How do we realize you know, um, our notions of security uh, in a dynamic environment where we're doing software management orchestration? Our vision is, of course, we want to be able to orchestrate security, manage it, and automate as many aspects to support disaggregated, multi-vendor RAN environments. So that's dealing with provisioning. How do we place security hardening controls, policies, uh, and implement best practices for security? With respect to what do we mean by best practices, we may be uh, mining those from ANISA, from MITRE FIGHT, from NIST, from DOD uh, uh, requirement specs. And how do we implement that when we deploy a 5G network and argue that we we're consistent and we can validate that we are addressing those, uh, those policies that we think that we need to deploy when we're gonna run in, in this particular hospital or inside this robotics factory? Are we meeting the requirements from a security perspective? How do we go about that? So that's provisioning and then orchestrations as we are deploying things using Kubernetes and dynamically managing those. Can we dynamically manage our security infrastructure, our policies? So every time you're instantiating a workload, if it, if it is supposed to run with the least permissive policy, that least permissive policy is being adapted and, and deployed with that, that workload. Absolutely. Um, so both of those aspects of provisioning and network orchestration is something we should consider. There are many security engines in Kubernetes that you can use to secure workloads, to secure the communications between the workloads, to do identity management, to do fine-grained uh, security analysis of devices, to do vulnerability inspection. There's a lot of security engines that you can use. Um, let me just focus on one, for example, the one that we've been developing called, um, called Kubarmer. Kubarmer is a cloud-native runtime security enforcement system that Im implements least permissive runtime policies on containers, on VMs, even on bare metal uh, um, processes uh, at the system level, meaning we can impose inline security protections at the system levels using both eBPF and LSMs. Uh, and it allows us to do continuous monitoring of application behavior, um, secure service endpoints from, 5G, uh, from inside the 5G control plane. So I don't mean it just as a generic workload. I mean, we understand what the AMF is, what it does, who it's allowed to talk to, what it should be writing, and, and how it should be interacting with the file system. We should understand those 
uh, those different network functions, what they're intended to do, and what, what is the least permissive policy that should go with them, and then implement that. Um, and then, of course, hardening um, the control plane such that it's meeting and satisfying different security compliance requirements, like, say, FITE or, or ENSA. And then implement, of course, least permissive policies across all of those workloads, hoping to implement uh, zero trust policies for the, for the entire 5G control plane for the core. Kube Armor does that, but there are other security engines that we could use, which I should stress, not that we only obsess with one, but that we can actually develop a way of integrating multiple security engines that do different kinds of security. Um, in the context of 5G, for example, uh, network functions are um, the different control plane applications and functions that have to be performed are modularized into virtual workloads that, that interact with one another, for example, in Kubernetes pods. And of course, we can have problems with those different workloads, and we don't want to allow one workload that becomes compromised to laterally attack other workloads, which is quite possible and quite common in the cloud computing, uh, computing environment. How do we deal with these particular sorts of problems? Ideally, each one of these workloads is operating in a manner such that it cannot violate uh, and it cannot operate outside the bounds of permissions that we've granted it. And if it attempts to do that, like the web UI interface for, for, uh, uh, for the control plane um, interacts with uh, uh, other network functions it's not supposed to, we should be able to prevent that, not just detect it. Of course, we'd want to monitor, alert, and potentially prevent that from doing something. So uh, one of the challenges, of course, we're going to have is you're going to have a lot of network functions inside of your 5G control plane. And I would like to have least permissive policies that are aware of what each function is supposed to do, how it's supposed to operate, uh, how it's supposed to interact with the other um, processes. That's a lot of security policy development. So one of the key things that we do is also look at the problem of, for each workload that we're processing, doing an analysis of its behavior, of its runtime behavior, and then deriving the policies for you automatically. So this idea of a building a policy discovery engine that generates the least permissive policies based on what it observes your, your, uh, your application doing, and then allowing you to transition the system into a policy enforcement uh, uh, implementation that then prevents other uh, permissions from being, uh, from being executed by that application is sort of the goal here. How do we constrain the, um, uh, each workload to only do what it's supposed to do? That's a lot of policies. We want to be able to automate that, and then we want to be able to orchestrate it, deploy it, and as your workloads are migrate, or instantiated or scaled, those policies go directly with the workload. An interesting twist on this is actually moving toward a, a much more automated way of creating 5G topologies and managing those 5G topologies. And FAO is very interesting from this perspective. There's also Silva. There's actually other um, major efforts that are going out there that are complementary or very similar to, to NEFIO. But the idea is here we want to simplify the deployment and management of multi-vendor cloud infrastructures that are going to implement our, you know, our, our, our network purpose. In many cases, it's 5G. We want to do fast onboarding of new network functions, deploy them, orchestrate them, scale them. Uh, and then we want to use configuration as data. We want to be able to express the intents and have the system grind off of those higher level abstract intents to create the topology to validate the apology is going to satisfy those intents and then deploy and, and uh, do runtime um, management. This is very interesting uh, from a how do we construct and manage and reduce the level of effort it takes to create 5G um, uh, infrastructures, edge infrastructures, cloud infrastructures in a much more consistent, less error prone way with less level of effort. From a security perspective, it introduces many challenges. And this is something that the security working group is looking at. Uh, which is network security intent op, uh, automation. If I have workloads and I describe intents, I need to convert those intents into security policies. Those security policies are going to be engine agnostic. You have lots of different security engines, dozens of security engines that I can apply. So when I describe an intent, I need to be able to convert that to which engines are available to monitor that workload, and how do I convert those intents into policies that those engines each can manage and, and perform or, or uh, implement to protect that particular workload, and then how do I, at runtime, monitor the system to make sure there aren't policy violations, that there aren't uh, that the systems are operating as intended from a security perspective. This is a very interesting aspect of security. Some place, uh, it's a place that we have to go as the network community is moving on to uh, intent-based networking. So intent-based security. So what if a user, if as a user, I could specify a security intent and then let 
Kubernetes reconciled the logic it takes to fulfill that intent by specifically looking at the workloads, the engines that are going to implement those, uh, converting those intents into policies, figuring out how the available security engines can implement those policies and then deploy those policies with my workloads and manage them with my workloads. That's sort of the core problem of in intent-based security. So intents, they need to be uh, uh, parameter agnostic they, uh, to the policy engines that they're going to be deployed to. Policy engines will use adapters to choose which intents they can solve, they can satisfy. Uh, adapters should admit policies that are relevant to those security engines. And if you had multiple security engines that can implement some aspect of a policy that came from the original intent, you may want to deploy those and offer a de defense in depth sort of uh, capability. So if you have a security intent that maybe can be satis par partially satisfied by managing the network communication uh, 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 policies, as well as maybe even the system uh, call level policies of the processes that need to interact with the network, to, you potentially could do it from both. So as an example, if you have a higher level uh, in, intent abstract that says, I want to prevent DNS manipulation, there is a way that aspects of that problem can be solved using Cilium and aspects that uh, can be solved using KubeArmor. The intent is basically agnostic to which engine is going to implement it. We need to have an adapter that converts that into a policy that makes sense from a KubeArmor perspective and from a Cilium perspective. And they go off and for that workload, implement those uh, and enforce those security policies. So at a high level, we've been developing out a project called Nimbus that is being built on top of, in fact, I believe has been released on R2 for Nephio which is attempting to do that. You have security intents that are, abstract, that are presented at an abstract level. Uh, you have adapters that can translate and bind those security intents into policies that are specific to the security engines that are available to protect those workloads, and then convert those uh, and deploy those policies with those security engines and have them enforce the security policies uh, that were originally required for the intent uh, as the security intents for that workload that entire process. That chain of reasoning is um, uh, being implemented in uh, a system called Nimbus that is trying to move us toward that notion of security intent automation. Uh, these are the elements of uh, security intent schema that can be developed out that describe for us uh, the high level intent, the detection method that we're gonna use for a given security engine to uh, perform to, to satisfy the security intent. If there is a mitigation strategy, express the mitigation strategy, et cetera. These are the basic elements that make up the policies of a security intent for a given uh, security engine or um, for a given policy. And we can map that back into a compliance rule. So we can look at the actual MITRE um, TTP that tells us that we should implement some sort of a, a, a mitigation against that particular TTP. And we should be able to implement that. Going back to those use cases of, uh, for 5G and for ORAN, um, when you build up these abstract intents, you can create libraries of security intents and you can actually formulate different uh, blueprints for the different use cases. So if you're gonna deploy a 5G topology inside of a hospital and have to be compliant with healthcare oriented uh, policies, you might be able to prepackage a blueprint of security intents that can be instantiated with the 5G uh, network that you deploy do the same thing for, uh, for automobile uh, robotics, for private 5G, for different enterprise requirements, for DOD. You'd have different security intents that you could pull together and create a blueprint of how I would deploy a DOD network or a hospital-based uh, 5G network um, to manage certain uh, MIOT devices. You can build these and then deploy them when you create and instantiate that particular uh, network instance and let the system itself take those intents, convert them into the available policy engines that your hospital will run, and then actually implement security at runtime for them. This is a, a key concept that we're uh, pursuing such that we can add an ability to prepackage it to intents so you even don't um, have to every time uh, create new intents, although you can um, actually give you an ability to do that. So I sort of talked about things in, in, in two perspectives. I talked about 5G security, and building uh, 5G uh, asset protection services as modular security functions that fit into uh, the ORAN architecture from two perspectives. One was from the edge security perspective of how do I extend the uh, 
the visibility of 5G radio access uh, networks to tell me what's happening from a security perspective between devices that are interacting with the radio access network in as, in as fine-grained and, and enough manner so that I can build security analytics like X apps and R apps that can do security analysis. So I consider that all 5G edge security. And we have a couple of projects that do that. We have MobiFlow, which is the basic security telemetry. Um, 5G Spectre, which is an example of a real-time X app that does security detection of cellular attacks. And DeepWatch, which is our first generation of a machine learning tool that can detect uh, uh, different kinds of security phenomena in a, in a more generalized way. Actually, all of those are hyperlinks. You can click those, get, get the Git repos, and actually run those independently right now. Uh, those are available. And on the other side, I talked about zero trust architectures for 5G. Um, I talked about this idea of creating security intents uh, and implementing security intents in an agnostic way across multiple security engines. That's Nimbus, and that's available for, uh, for download. Um, 5G Kubarmer is the tool that we're using, our specific security tool that's designed to implement least permissive policies, discover least permissive policies for all the different network functions inside your 5G network. Uh, that's available on Git. And then finally, we're working on a new thing called SentryFlow, which is doing uh, API analysis to be able to look for different sorts of security attacks uh, between uh, network functions. Look for E2 manager subscription DDoS attacks, um, AMF flooding to, or probing to detect uh, network functions that are asking for authentication of devices that shouldn't be doing that. Uh, there are lots of examples of what you can do once you're inside the boundary and able to communicate with different network functions in the control plane. That's where SentryFlow would kick in and actually could do security analysis, anomaly detection of the API calls between network security functions. I didn't present, sorry, SentryFlow, but I presented the other ones. So those are the two sorts of elements that we're working on. Uh, what's making up the core of the activity that we're doing inside the Nefrio Working Group is really the zero trust frameworks for runtime, in addition to the other things that we're doing. Um, because there's things going on for uh, code hygiene, how do you do you know, reasonable release management from a security perspective? But also this runtime policy management, how do you, do, how do you develop out the notion of security intents? Definitely working on that. Um, our main site for all of these are you know, github.com slash 5gsec or 5gsec.com, uh, where we have our uh, tools. Oh, I think I'm going to stop there. Any questions? It's okay that you don't, but it's cool if you do, too. Uh, where, where are we with this? Uh, so where do we think we're moving? Um, 6G is interesting. Uh, I think a lot of the work, because we're you know, coming from the research community, going beyond 5G and thinking through what's going to happen, we have to do much more intelligent spectrum management. When we have much larger scale uh, interactions with devices, when we really want to fully embrace the notion of AI ops, fully uh, automated AI stacks on top of 5G control planes, no humans involved, can I still manage and reliably control a 5G network? All interesting topics from a 6G uh, perspective, as well as very mission critical specific, you know, still is gonna be a lot focused on mission critical 5G because we're from the security community, that's what we tend to, uh, to focus on. Um, that is, you know, we're still asking ourselves about the depth of visibility uh, of what it is we need to do to capture in order to do meaningful security analysis. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. How does this uh, whiteness be applied in a, in a non-homogeneous kind of a, uh, a loop? Yes. Yes, thank you, Tim. That is a very good question. Um, yeah, hybrid, hybrid uh, uh, cloud environments where you have a mixture of part of the workloads and functionalities happening on VMs, on bare metal, on classic Kubernetes structures. Uh, there are services that allow you to run workloads across uh, different hardware infrastructure. Um, I, I'm not going to address the, you know, can you blend Wi-Fi with 5G, but definitely in hybrid cloud, uh, you have to deal with the notion security engines may be operating on drastically, you know, to, to manage functions that are implemented in drastically different ways on, in drastically different environments. Not just everything's clean, containerized. Uh, we have to be able to deal with that. That is absolutely within the scope of what the working group has to be able to solve with respect to security. I didn't actually present that slide, but yes, good, good question. <laughs> 